What's up, everybody? Welcome to Mind Your Money with Miss Be Helpful, a show that highlights people and stories that will inspire you to get your money right. And this week on the podcast, I am so excited. I'm beyond excited because I have a very special guest in honor of Women's History Month. I am with Carrie Schwab Pomerantz, who is a certified financial planner. You all probably know her very well, but just in case you don't, she is very well known for being a leading advocate for financial literacy all across the country. She's the devoted her career to helping people of all different backgrounds to really help them achieve financial security. Um, Carrie currently oversees Schwab's corporate philanthropy and their employee volunteer programming, um, which is incredible. I mean, hashtag goals. And right now what they're doing is really helping to strengthen communities where Schwab operates, which is amazing. So I am so honored to have you on. Welcome to the show, Carrie. Thank you, Yanelli. So great to be with you today. We're going to talk a little bit more about, you know, how we got connected and projects that we've done. But I always just love to jump right in at the beginning of the podcast because listeners are just dying to hear from you some of the juicy topics that people don't often talk about when it comes to money. And one of those is regrets. People just like to kind of bury those under the carpet, make sure nobody finds them. And I like to really bring them to the forefront because I think it's important for people to talk about the regrets so that other people listening in can learn from those mistakes and those regrets and really, you know, strengthen their future pathway with their money by learning from those, you know, from other people's mistakes. Um, so I'm going to start with that. I'm going to just sure. jump right into sure. what, ha- what is, if you could think of like the biggest regret that you've made around money, what would you say that that big regret would be? <laughs> so I've always been a saver and investor my entire life, uh, starting even as a kid. Uh, and, and that's just because of my childhood and, and so forth, you know, what I, what I spent, I had to make or find or whatever. But, you know, growing up at Schwab and working at Schwab, I obviously learned to be an investor and started it in my 20s and always kind of managed my own money. And it wasn't really till I was about 40, early 40s, that, I, that a friend said to me, Carrie, you know, what are you doing? Why don't you get professional help? And, you know, here I am, I, I'm, I'm a professional but the reality was I was a mom of three kids you know, in the middle of raising them. I had a big job. I'm flying all over the country and I wasn't able to really focus on my money, you know, day to day as like a professional would. But, so I thought about it and it, admittedly, you know, like, I was worried that I didn't want anybody to see my finances. It was personal, right? I didn't want any judgment. I, yeah, it was just private for me. But I finally took my friend, my colleague's advice, and I, and I did um, sign up for this more professional help from Schwab. And over time, I thought, you know what? I like this. There was just sort of a comfort that somebody else, while I'm flying jet setting all over, is looking at my finances. And, and then I sort of upgraded to an even to an RAA, a registered investment advisor, who I um, delegate to do my day-to-day finances, but we're very much in partnership. And I equate now professional help or an advisor as like having a, uh, having a personal trainer in a way. Mm. It's, it's, what, what ends up happening is, is you, that, that advisor, that counselor, whatever it may be, perf, uh, you know, personal trainer he or she keeps you accountable. You, know, you have to show up and you learn, you learn from your colleague and, and you get better results. So I am a big believer in getting help. And I always tell people, listen, even the professionals get help. I mean, if you think about it, a doctor is not going to do surgery on him or herself or herself, <laughs> or even look at the best athletes of the world. They have coaches, they have trainers, right? And so it's kind of the same thing. So my point is, no matter who you are, unless you really want to, I mean, unless you really have the time to, to really focus on it, um, that, that I suggest getting help. And there's all sorts of different levels of help. So I like, you know, I personally love it. And it's, a, yeah. you know, it's kind of a peace of mind. Yeah, I, I agree. I think peace of mind is a great way to describe it. And I love that you brought up the, the issue of time, because I do think that like for me and my experience, I've always had the time to manage my own money because I didn't I wasn't making a lot of money, first of all. And I wasn't like super, super busy. But once I did like level up in my career, you know, once I started making six figures and I'm now, you know, traveling a bit more and taking on more responsibility, managing a team. I'm like, you know, I 
I kind of find myself not having as much time. I mean, people who listen to my show know that I'm a very passive investor, so I don't have a lot of like active management or any kind of need for like constant activity in my accounts. Yeah. But, but you're right. It's nice to know, like once you get to a certain level, that you have that support and business owners too. I mean, small business owners, once you get to a certain point, I mean, you should not be doing everything yourself. You need to get help. You need a team. And I, and I really like that you brought that up, that it feels like peace of mind because you know that your situation is being taken care of by somebody who is trustworthy. Um, and, And I always say, when it comes to advisors, if you are looking for a financial advisor, Go, go for fiduciary advisors, because that's going to make sure that they're really looking out for your best interest okay. and, you know, really making sure that they, um, you know, that there's no conflict of interest. They're looking out for what you need based on your goals and your needs. And that's make a great sure it's somebody that you, ha- you share chemistry with. Yeah. It's really important. It's somebody that you feel that respects you, no matter, you know, your knowledge or how many questions you ask, you've got to really feel like that person's there for you. I love that. What about on the flip side of regrets? Something that you don't regret. And maybe it's an expensive purchase or maybe it's a time where you, you know, you spend a lot of money relative to like the other categories of your budget, but you don't regret it. And it was totally worth it for you. Well, that's an easy one for me. And I would say (laughs) philanthropy. Philanthropy is very different today. Young people, even in high school and grade school, get exposed to it, you know, getting involved in the community. I wasn't really exposed to it. And, and I don't know if it was a generational thing or um, just my family. And, and, and so it wasn't until my early 30s, I was living in Atlanta. And a girlfriend who also worked in financial services asked me and about seven other women in financial services to come meet the executive director of the Atlanta Women's Foundation, which was an organization to help um, women in all categories uh, you know, of their lives. And in particular, what they wanted to do is bring us together and fundraise for women's economic parity, you know, making sure they had the job skills and getting paid more and daycare, just things that they had, you know, more parity financially. And it was it was over a dinner. And I remember so vividly, you know, I I went home that night, I went to sleep and I was tossing and turning all night because it was a big commitment. She was asking us at the time to raise $50,000 three years in a row. And at that time, that was a lot of, a lot of money. And I had never raised a dime in my life. I never asked anybody for money. And, and so I tossed and turned because I was so excited by this opportunity to help women financially. And, and it was almost like I had a light, you know, light bulb or, you know, gas light in there and somebody lit a match of my passion for helping women. And some of the gals on our, at our lunch or dinner didn't, didn't join, but I did. And again, scared to death because I never asked for money. <laughs> and I ended up being the number one fundraiser for the group. And I uh, ended up being the chair. And that really launched my philanthropy because it opened up my life in so many different ways. You know, afterwards, then I went on another, you know, on a nonprofit board and I you know, end up being chair of that. It was for girls, young girls. And, and I, I actually, a few years ago, I did a speech, you know, like a breakfast speech. And I called, the, I named the speech Chips and Wine. And it was really all about philanthropy. And I was equating to philanthropy like chips and wine, where once you have one, like if you have one glass of wine or you have one chip, you have to have another, right? There's just no way that you are, um, you're sticking to one. At least I don't have that kind of uh, self-control. self-control. <laughs> yeah. And I just, you know, it's just, it, it, it's, it's it's a snowball effect where you get really involved. You know, fast forward, here I am running the Charles Schwab Foundation. Who would have known? I was always a business person and I still am a business person. But but the point is, it is my my life is, is so much better um, than would have had it not had I not had philanthropy in my life. And so I feel really good about making donations and getting involved. And I would say, so it's not only an investment in, in our, my communities, but it's also an investment in myself. So long-winded answer, philanthropy is definitely uh, one that I love to do. I love that. There's, um, there's a personal finance uh, guru kind of influencer um, 
named Ramit Sethi. And he talks about this a lot where he says like, you don't need a lot of money to give. Like you could create, like you could start a scholarship program where you give 500 bucks to a student that is really inspiring. A student who, who's making an impact and, and doing work that it impresses you and is something that, you know, you're, you're charged up and fired up about, you know, you could start with 500 bucks. You can start with any amount that you can give. It doesn't have to be like philanthropy kind of People hear that and they go, well, you've got to be given millions of dollars to make an impact. And that's just not true. So I love that answer because uh, I think it like it's a call to action to people to find even small ways to give. It really changes your psychology because research shows that when you give, your brain chemistry really changes. Like you start to feel more gratitude. You start to feel more positive feelings because of giving. It really changes yeah. the way you feel when you get up in the morning. You feel better and it just, it helps people, but it also helps you too. I love that, yeah. that answer. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what happened to me. I love hearing about your passion for helping women too, because we know in the financial industry, women are underrepresented. And I, when I started first learning about money, it was back when I was paying off credit card debt. And I was just trying to understand like, what is a credit score? Like, how do you fix your credit score? And every book I found, every video I found, every article, it felt like everything was written by men. And it was just it was so hard to find women in the space. And when I finally did, I was like, oh my goodness, this is so refreshing to hear a woman's perspective because like the data shows, women don't deal with money the same way that men do. We have other challenges. We have different things that happen throughout our careers and our lives. Our lifespans are longer on average. I mean, there's just different yeah. things, right? So yeah. we kind of have to come from a different perspective. And so I just love that we have this, shared passion for really uh, yeah. targeting women and helping women and empowering them. Um, and then of course, this conversation is happening in, you know, Women's History Month, which is even better to highlight this. Yeah. You and I met because of the Savvy documentary, which um, Robin Hauser put together. And it, it's such an incredible film. It really highlights women taking charge of their finances. And so we, we met at an event and we both spoke on a panel. And I just said, you know what? I, I want to have a conversation with Carrie one-on-one. I got to learn more about her. And, and one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, why did you decide to get involved with the Savvy film? There's so much going on in it, a lot of different women's stories. Why did you feel like it was important for your story to be part of, or your voice to be part of that film? Yeah. Well, first of all, Robin reached out to me very early on, and you know, I didn't even know who she was. And I did take a risk by, okay, I'll join, I'll be a part of it. But, but you know, as, as I mentioned the story about my passion around helping women and that my girlfriend in Atlanta sort of unleashed that passion that I didn't even know I had. I mean, I was very lucky to really, you know, to find that. And it's funny when I talk to my girlfriends after about being involved and telling this story, they, my girlfriend from college said, Carrie, you were always that way. You were always sort of fighting for women's equality and so forth. So who knows why? But, but when I look back in my childhood in LA, and a lot of people don't necessarily know this, but when I was nine years old, my parents divorced. And this was a time when a lot of couples, it was sort of the beginning of the rise of divorce. It was kind of unheard of. My dad was a struggling businessman. My mom, they actually met at Stanford. So very, you know, smart couple, um, but young, right? And, you know, their hands full and so forth. So my dad was a struggling businessman. He had, he was at least 15 years away from the Charles Schwab we all know today, at least. So, and, and my mom was a homemaker, so she was sort of a woman of her time. And so I saw how money really tore our family apart. It rocked our boat. It even still rocks our boat to this day. Mm. It's just, you know, it, it, that's just, you know, unfortunately the nature of, of divorce. And, and I can only think about that is why what really at the core affected me um, long-term, you know, that, that it's so important for women in particular, because we do take that the home caring role um, more so than men. I know it's changing some, but but that we both, you know, that we all be involved. And 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 so it was because of my advocacy around women that I was asked to run the Charles Schwab Foundation. And and while I could have made it all about women investors, I realized a couple, you know, a couple things. Um, one is, is that I wanted our philanthropy to represent our, um, our heritage as a company. And that is always to break down barriers for investors, for everyday Americans to participate in building wealth. And, I, and a lot of that 
again, I think that's in my DNA. Uh, you know, apples don't fall far from the tree. That's what my dad has always been about. That's what I, I've always been about. And so I've always wanted to sort of break down even more barriers, right? And in this time, it was always about, about women. And through my years of work, whether, you know, again, working from the rich to the poor, I have found that the lack of financial literacy in this country cuts across Americans from all walks of life. It does not matter about socioeconomic status, true. gender, age. And by the way, it doesn't even depend on how smart you are, right? We talked, we've talked about that. That's right. Like the brightest, smartest people neglect their finances. And so it doesn't have to be that way. And as you meant, as you mentioned, it's it's even more acute for women. Again, we historically have taken a backseat role. And for what you know, social, cultural reasons, uh, that that some are in our control and some are not in our control. And 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 I was really surprised. You know, I've, I've seen through so many years of working on this that we were make, that women are making strides. And I really attribute that to the 401k. That, that it, I, when I first got into the workforce, the 401k was not, uh, wasn't really even well known, to be honest with you. It wasn't until a little yeah. bit later. I think it was the IRA. That's how I saved, uh, you know, for my retirement, my IRA. And that, by the way, you can only save $2,000 in your IRA. But, but I did, you know, as soon as I got my first job, I started to do that. Yeah. But I was really surprised by the savvy film and by the research, knowing, you know, this research and so forth that millennial women are abdicating more of their finances to their partners. And so I, you know, here I thought, wow, we're making strides as women, we're more in the workforce, we're, we're saving and investing in our 401ks, but millennial women are, are, are abdicating more. And so I think it's a major setback for women. And I always like to think, you know, I, um, I know I've been on this mission like you. Let's we've got to bring our fellow, um, you know, gender <laughs> with yeah. us. I, I, you know, I want to protect everybody. I want to protect them, and and I don't mean at the expense of their partner at all. It has nothing to do with that. You know, it's just a matter of respect, respect right. for your partner, respect for yourself, and so forth. And I look at the lack of, or I look at financial literacy in LA like swimming. It is a life skill that we all must have. And if you think that, that life is nothing but stormy seas, and if you're on a boat you know, in stormy seas with your partner, and he knows or she knows how to swim, but you don't, and, and your partner falls off the boat, you're out of luck, or you both fall out of the boat, you're out of luck. And so the bottom line is, doesn't mean you have to be, you know, professional. It doesn't mean you have to know every little bit, but you need to know where your assets are, what you're invested in, and, and be involved with all the big decisions. And you have to just have the basics, just the basics. And then you can really protect yourself and, and your goals together will be much more likely to be achieved. I was just going to jump in and say, I love the bold analogy because... That's really what's happening is you're putting yourself in a situation where you fully depend on yeah. someone else to save you. Yeah. I mean, why? <laughs> why, would, why, why would you willingly yeah. put yourself in a situation where you say, I'm yeah. just going to, I'm just going to let someone else have to be the one to save me if I need saving. Yeah. Like I'm just, and, and that's, I don't think enough, enough people view it that way through that lens or like from that yeah. perspective of like, you know, what you're doing is saying that if you're ever in a financial rut, like you won't know how to get out of it. Or you're just going to have to like, be like, baby, save me. And it's like, that's just not, I mean, that doesn't, that's not the most sensible way to approach your life. You should be able to say, all right, well, I've got the basic, the foundational skills to be able to at least know what to do. If I can't do it myself, I'll know where to go. I'll know where to find records and, and accounts. And I'll have the basics that I need yeah. to be able to put somewhat of a plan together to figure it out if I need to. Yeah. Empowering women to really say, just get the basics. Like, you don't need to be an expert in every single dollar, where it is, where it's going, where yeah. it's come from. But you knew, you do need you know, just the basics, because depending on someone else to save you financially is obviously not a really smart decision to make. Yeah, yeah, totally. Agree. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's something where I think like, 
the the point you made about like generationally like um like your mom being a woman of her generation like you know my mom also did not work she had so many kids it was like impossible to afford child care for so many kids so she was like yeah. you know what it makes more sense for me to take yeah. care of them and, and save on the costs and me watching her be at home all the time meant she depended on my dad. She depended yeah. on my dad to, to be able to give her money to, to buy groceries and to get school supplies when she needed. She always had to tell him when she needed money, how much she needed and what it was for. And I know like now when I talk to my mom, she kind of like sighs, like, oh, you know, like, like it's so frustrating and I had to spend my life explaining why I need money and how much I need and what I need it for. Like how amazing would it have been for her to just have the agency yeah. to, yes. to get, to get the money that she needs yeah. for whatever, without having to yeah. explain herself, yeah. you know? So yeah. yeah, I think it's definitely generational shifts. And since we do now have the ability to do that, we should take advantage of it as, um, you know, young women, career women, I think like more women are working now. I mean, it just makes sense to, you know, grab the bull by the horns and, and be in control of like the decisions you make around money. But, but you know what, Carrie, I do think that there's something to say about history because the reason why so many women are not yet super comfortable, it's really this trajectory that kind of came from the past of like women not being able to. So I, I'm going to segue to this point that you made in the film, which in Savvy, you said that People don't really know this, but women did not really have access to credit in their own name till just a few decades ago. Wow. You needed, you know, a man with you. And so this is something I think, again, people need to know and people need to, we need that historical context. And, and I'm sure you agree, this historical context is really important. And, and why do you think that this needs to be part of our discussions around money? Because I feel like, you know, people kind of bring it up, but not really. It's not the mainstream narrative that like women are just yeah. recently getting their own uh, access to money. You're absolutely right. And what I mentioned in the Savvy film was, I think it was 1974, when women could have access to a credit card. And, I like, and I'm thinking, that's in my lifetime. I couldn't, you know, you know, if I were a little older, I wouldn't have been able to have a credit card. I mean, appalling. You know, I'm a very independent person. Thankfully, my husband, he's, he, incur he, he loves that I'm independent. Mm -hmm. um, but but it, so, so there's been social, cultural issues that get in the way of, of us um, being our best and, or, or having the most opportunities. And, and in this particular, it was a structural discrimination and similar to redlining for um, black Americans in this country, you know, even voting that we saw, I think it was not even until the sixties or oh, it was the sixties, right? Mm -hmm. So just that's what holds us all back. And it creates generational issues, you know, going, going forward. Well, we, our, our mothers, by the way, are our mentors, whether they like it or not. That's who we, yeah. who we follow. And if, if our moms weren't involved with money, how do we, you know, how do we over, overcome that? So I, what I, what I talk about also, you know, and I know you've heard me talk about this before, is that the lack of financial literacy in this country is a social justice issue. You know, it, it means lack, it means lack of access or opportunity, you know, sort of unfair access. And, and that's been the case in our systems for a long time. And what the lack of financial literacy does, it contributes to so many social issues that we see today, and including gender inequality, um, wealth inequality, college access. A lot of young people. Uh, don't even think about college until they learn financial literacy. From our programming with Boys and Girls Club, the kids who go through our Money Matters program are more likely to seek out going to college. Even if they save $1,000, it opens up their life to more opportunity and they, and they go for it. Yeah. But then also young people take on too much credit or, or, or college debt. And uh, Anna Marie Lissardi, you know, who, who studies this uh, relentlessly, uh, had a study that said that college kids said that they would never have taken as much debt had, as they did had they not understood or had the basis of financial literacy. So right. that's how that contributes to the college access or even workforce readiness. Uh, uh, a, a bad credit score can get in yeah. the way of whether you're going to get your dream job. That's right. Yeah. Or lack of productivity. So anyway, so, so there are structural issues, but the bottom line is we can't let that get in our way. And, and that's, that's no, that's not an excuse. We've all got it, you know, take charge, really.
Yeah, we do. We do have to own it. But I think, I mean, I, I, I grew up in New York City and I know like the sentiment there has always very much been like, when you do everything right, there are still challenges because the, of the systemic barriers. And in young yeah. people now, it's like this, like blame the system because what, I mean, for example, I mean, you know my story, Carrie, like I got a scholarship to Brown. I went off to college, got the degree, pursued, you know, education and became a teacher and then took a nonprofit route. And everybody's looking at me like, wow, a successful professional, you know, with a career and director at this institution and that. And, but I had all this credit card debt and I didn't know anything about how to make a budget and like nobody anywhere between my K through 12 education between my master's my bachelor's nowhere did somebody say you've got to learn the basics around your your personal financial uh capability because if you don't it doesn't matter how successful you are the money's going to come in and it's going to go out and you're not going to be able to keep any of it and grow any of it over time and yeah. so I think that, you know, you bring up a lot of societal problems that I completely agree. And, and you say like, well, they're not an excuse. We do need to, to own them, right? But I do think that sometimes people give up hope and they're like, well, how do we even fix these problems? Like, there's just no way, right? They're, they're part of the system, they're systemic. Um, and so I'm interested to hear what you think could give us a glimmer of hope. Like, what are ways that we could tackle some of these societal problems, like individuals and families, or if you're a small business owner or you, or you have a large company, like, even the government, like what are some things that we can do that are actionable that would help us fix a lot of the problems that you brought up? Yeah, we've got to come together. So, so take responsibility in all aspects and in all institutions in our lives. So as, as individuals, as families, uh, employers, looking at employers, uh, nonprofits, right? Like, you know, um, what you do and, and um, schools, and, yeah. and, 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 and government, government, whether it's federal or, or local, if we all come together, we can make a big difference. When I was on the U.S. President's Advisory Council on Financial Capability under Obama, I uh, chaired the Partnership Committee. And I remember Michelle Obama took on childhood obesity yeah. as her social issue as First Lady. And I remember in the headlines, it was printed big, you know, big print a couple of years later about how the child of obesity had gone down. And you know why? It's because she got every institution of society to, to be involved. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember, you know, as you know, I'm on the National Board of Boys and Girls Club. Boys and Girls Club was really taking ownership on that, you know, because they provide meals and snacks for kids. They really changed it up um, on behalf of kids. So they, they took her message, her, her national message to heart. And I think everybody did. And so what do I, you know, what do I think, uh, you know, that we ought to do as a, as a country? Um, I mean, parents, uh, parents need to talk to their daughters just the same as their sons. Yes. Uh, you know, you, you know, you and I've talked about this. You know, women have, um, I mean, they're paid less than men. They're, um, uh, well, you know, they live longer, as you mentioned, in and out of the workforce. And, and because they live longer, they have more, they have less money to save for more years of retirement. So that's why we have to, so, 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 so it all starts at home. And, and, and the reason I say that is because, and I think I mentioned this on the Savvy film, is that parents talk to their daughters differently than their sons. With their sons, they talk about wealth building uh, disciplines, disciplines, you know, uh, investing and debt or debt management. And we both know that's how you build wealth. If you use both of those, if you do those both responsibly. With their daughters, they, they talk about savings and household expenditures. And budgeting is super important, no doubt. Boys should learn that too. But to right. build well and, and protection and financial security, we have to um, we we have to teach, talk to our daughters just the same as our sons. So that's just an that's just an example. And and um, so and, and unfortunately, only 21 states. And I know this is the work you you know where you spend a lot of time on. That only I think it's 21 states that. Uh, mandate some level of financial literacy. And even that's really spotty. I think 10% of under-resourced uh, schools and children 
get financial literacy. So that's yeah. part of the lack of lack of access. And you know, that's I mentioned right. businesses trying to do more. A, a couple of things at Schwab, we uh, you know we've had these national partnerships, financial literacy partnerships with Boys and Girls Club, Donors Choose. Now we're going to be doing something with with Girl Scouts. Uh, so we're really trying to do our part. And then we just um, launched a big program called Money Wise America, where we're training all our employees to be volunteers, financial literacy volunteers, and we have created. Uh, evidence-based um, uh, curriculum, you know, uh, based on standards, uh, what is it, core standards, right. and so we hope to be in every school in America at some point in the next, what, five years. That might be a little overly ambitious, and, and also, you know, you asked me a big question, so I'm kind of going on and on, but, but you also um, asked me about, you know, what all we can do, the workplace, right. that was something I worked on with President Obama. The workplace now is really focused on, um, on financial literacy. And, and, and because Schwab, we provide 401ks to different companies. They're asking more and more to help for their employees because A, they, don't, they realize if they don't want their employees retiring with no money, that doesn't feel right, feel good. <laughs> but also selfishly, if they don't have a, an employee that feels good about their, their finances, they bring their stress to the work. You know, they're la they lack productivity. Um, and, and, you know, I was talking to a general um, who serves on the Boys and Girls Club board with me, a four-star general. He just retired. And I said to him, I said, I understand with the military, you look at credit scores. And he said, yeah. And he said, we do. He said, you know why? And I said, why? And he said, because somebody with a bad credit score can be seen as a risk. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, whatever that might mean, financial risk or character risk, I don't know. But, but the point is, employers are trying to do something about it because they need talent and they need people who feel really engaged in their business. And in going back to, there's so much help out there now. You do not have to be rich to get help. I promise you. Uh, if you're if you're going to a place that you have to be rich, then forget it. Don't go there. There's plenty yeah. more financial institutions that will help you and want to help you. So, so that's, I think, a glimmer of hope as well. Yeah, that's a great point, because I think a lot of people, they think that and I used to think this, I'm not going to lie. Um, up to very recently, I used to think that you can not even get a meeting with a financial advisor unless you have a net worth of, you know, quarter of a million dollars, half a million dollars or more, they, they usually don't work with you. And that's true for some financial for advisors, some. but that's not true for all of them. And so it's interesting because there was this myth that I just accepted as a fact in my head that I, I was like, oh, well, I'm not gonna be able to work with a professional around money unless I build my network to a certain level. And so that means that people, you know, everyday people who don't have those amounts of money aren't gonna be able to get this. And that's just not true. You just have to find resources that do allow you to get yeah. that kind of a service. Um, so I, I love that you bring that up, that you don't, that's not true. You don't, it's not just the rich that get help. It's just that some services are targeted towards them. That's yeah. fine. There's others that target you to so just find yeah. those. Yeah, well, I was gonna say, and not to tout Schwab, but Schwab, Schwab is happy no matter how much money you have. Say it, so is Vanguard and Fidelity. Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to present is schwabmoneywise.com, which is our website for that is an educational website, has tools, calculators. There's something for everybody, even for me, as I say, I'm, I'm still always learning. And so I had, that's another resource I want to uh, present to your, to, to your listeners. Love that. Thank you for sharing that because I think people oftentimes don't know where to go to get free resources. It's, it seems like today, like everybody wants to put stuff behind a paywall. Like when you find yeah. a really good course, you're like, oh, I want to do this. And then when you click through, it's like you have to pay this much money to take the course or you have to pay this much money to get access to the spreadsheet or, and it, you know, online right now, everything's all about clicks and sales. And so when you hear about like actually free resources that you can just access them online and start using them right away. It's awesome to hear about those and share those because it's, it's getting more and more rare. People want your email. They want your credit card information. And it, it's, it's starting to get more and more difficult yeah. to find quality resources that are actually free. And that's the thing, quality. I just want to, I just want to throw that out there because there is a lot of information. It's overload with social media. And I just, I, I just, Again, to your listeners, to you know anybody who will listen to me, is is be careful <laughs> on who you're listening to, really, 
uh, make sure it's a reputable source of, of, of information around managing money. When I started posting my YouTube videos, people would ask me all the time, like, oh, can you tell me what to invest in? And I'm like, no, I can't because I'm not certified to do that. <laughs> like, I, I will be completely honest. I can educate you. I can tell you how to compare mutual funds, but then you have to go and do the comparing. Like, I can't yeah. do that work for you. And I think there's so many different conflicts of interest online where you see people giving advice, but they benefit in some way from that type of advice. And so now more than ever, we have to be really cautious of what, we, what we're looking at online. What, who's the source? What is this yeah. person who's sharing this information? information? What do they get out of it? Uh, you know, like just really being more cautious because social media has created a lot of influencers, um, but not a lot of influential thinkers. And I think it's, it's important to really, you know, pay, pay attention to that distinction that, you yeah. know, you can be trying to influence people all you want, but at the end of the day, it's got to be in the best interest of the person receiving the advice, not vice versa. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And it's tough. Cause I think that kids growing up now just have to deal with so much more. Like, I mean, They've got social media, they've got cryptocurrency. I mean, just making money decisions today is so different from what it was like back in the day that I think that's why people are really looking for yeah. a, a, a way, an easy way, because like, it's just so, so complex now. Like, how can we find a way to simplify it? Usually going online and just following advice from someone, it feels very easy, but you know, easy doesn't always make it right. So I, I just, yeah, definitely want to underscore your point about be careful what you read, what you watch, who you're listening to, um, and, and make sure it's trusted sources of information. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind me to kind of glomming on to what you just said, because I, I do talk a lot about that. And it's not about the hot stock it really isn't. We're hearing a lot about the hot thing. And, yeah. and just know that there's that speculation. And, and you mentioned you're invested in passive investments, probably mutual funds, ETFs. Yeah, I'm in the same way, by the way. I'm a big believer in passive investing. And there's this whole notion of core and explore. You have your core holdings, the, you know, the money that you know you absolutely want to grow for some you know, important goals for yourself. That should be your retirement, you know, your child's college education, you know, whatever it may be. And, and, and you have in core holdings of, of, of mutual funds and ETFs, which is a basket of, of stocks. And then if you want to explore, like buy a little bit of crypto or one of those mean stocks, that's okay. But just know that you're taking on a lot of risk. That's your yeah. explore component of your investment strategy. So I, love I, that. I just, yeah. I never so, heard that before. Core and explore. I like that. So wait, so Carrie, what would you say would be like, a fair and then not that this is like a, a hard and fast rule for anybody, but like a ballpark, like around how much is the percentage of where you should have your core and a percentage where you should have your explore. So I've never been asked that before, but I'm just going to say 90% in your core and 10% in your explore. And as long as you're saving and investing, you know, over the long term, you're putting, you know, money on, on a regular basis, like auto, you know, auto saving and investing similar to a 401k. Uh, in your core, in your you know doing enough to, for your retirement and whatever, then you can you have you have extra money. That's where you can do some exploring. It means that no matter what happens to that small section of your explore money, you are going to be taken care of. You are going to have a stable future because your core is solid and in place and right. just kind of riding the market. And so, right. I mean, and if more people did that. Oof, we, you know, we wouldn't have as many issues with people not being prepared for retirement or not being able to help um, yeah. the next generation pay for college and things like that, or being able to get a house, right? Things like that. Right. Or their own protection, financial security yeah. later in life. By the way, it's something like 80% of those in poverty are, you know, elderly women. Mm. So I did not know that. I did some, not I, know I, that. It's, it's been a long time since I looked at that stat, but it's pretty yeah. big. And again, that gets back to all the, you know, everything you and I have just been talking about. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I know that a lot of people listening are probably just so curious about your upbringing because, you know, you, your father is the Charles Schwab. And while many people probably just know him for, you know, Charles Schwab being the super successful company that is today, they might not really know that, you know, 
he kind of worked really hard, like you mentioned before, starting for many, many years with just a small business. I mean, like, you know, pretty much a startup and turning that into a successful company was not an, it was not an overnight success kind of a thing. So yeah. um, it's interesting now to, you know, for for you to be able to kind of share what, what was it like growing up um, in, in, in experiencing or I guess witnessing is a better word, the the growth and the changes of, of you know, a company like Schwab and then if there are any like early money lessons, I always like to ask my guests, like what money memories, early money lessons do you remember from early family life that, you know, you still remember now and, and that you, that you're, you know, willing to share? Yeah. So, so I, you know, I did allude to this when, when I was, you know, nine years old when my parents divorced, my dad had, I don't even know what exactly he was doing, but he had several businesses that went out of business wow. and it wasn't until 1974 that he started Schwab and it, it was a startup, total startup. And then it was a couple of years when I was 16. So it was 76 that I was asked to, if you, I wanted to come work at Schwab. And uh, it's funny. I used to tell people I was the secretary secretary, but my dad said, <laughs> no, Carrie, you were a file clerk. And, and, you know, and he's saying, and I don't know that many people really, many people even know what a file clerk does. Because we barely file anymore, right? That's so true. We file on our computers, that's about it. But I was, you know, putting new account applications in the cabinet. But, wow. but yeah, yeah. And, but, but Schwab, again, in those days, it took a long time. Well, you know, well into the 80s to really grow and be successful. It had a lot of rocky, you know, times. Yeah. And um, so I, you know, I, I was, I always worked, you know, like, I started working when I was 13, you know, with the paper route mm. and babysat. I even tried house cleaning that did not go over well. And, <laughs> and, and then, you know, I started working summers, you know, when I was a teenager, legitimate, right? 16 yeah. on always. Right. And, and some, you know, I've worked at different companies, but mostly at Schwab in the summers and so forth. So I, so my parents, like you said, osmosis. It wasn't, I didn't get an allowance um, like we talk about today, which I yeah. gave my kids. And, but, um, but I, I, but what I learned is the power of saving, you know, started saving when I was nine and never mm-hmm. stop. Always, always work, always save it because I wanted choices. Like I never wanted to be like our moms and have to ask for spending right. money, never but to be in that position. And, and, and so I, I, I garnered a very strong work ethic and you know, still working today. And, you know, I love it. I love it. It's not work to me. So saving and, and, um, and a strong work ethic, but then yeah. when I became a broker, you know, a financial consultant, uh, about a year after college and, um, it was time to save in my IRA for so my first time I was going to, you know, put money in and invest. And I call kind of like what you refer to talk to when people ask you for advice. I yeah. called my dad and I was like 23 years old. And I asked him, I said, dad, what do you think I should invest in? And I thought for sure he would tell me the hot stock, you know, like, <laughs> and no, you know, what he told me, he said, Carrie, go to our mutual fund marketplace. In other words, our list of mutual fund companies that we do business with, mm-hmm. just pick two. I, I was thinking, again, I was doing the $2,000. So I put $1,000 in each, just pick two equity funds mm-hmm. and, and, and you'll be fine. Yeah. It's not about, it's, it's about participating in the market. It's not about the hot stock. Wow. And, and, and so I talked about core and explore you know, light bulb. I had moments of disappointment, but he was so right. It's not about picking the hot stock uh, because that can really burn you. And in fact, you know, I've had a few of those where I dabbled for fun and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't good, but you know, I, of course that was my explore, right? I knew the potential of losing money and, and the core, the mutual funds are really, really what um, I think provides the success. And it's what it's what pension funds use, that's universities, right. endowments, that, you know, that's the strategy, sort of, the, I'll call it the core and explore, um, a, you know, very diversified portfolio. So that is one of my money tips <laughs> that now I pass on to others. 
it's, it's so interesting to see how social media makes it seem like the people that make all the money in the stock market are the people that pick that hot stock. But, you know, what I always tell, like, especially because I have little brothers who are definitely getting to that age where they want to, you know, get meme stocks and get yeah. do crypto and get this, all that kind of stuff, the risky stuff and the speculative stuff. And I tell them, listen, sure, play with it with a little bit of money. But even let's say the best case scenario happens. Let's say you, you know, 100x your money in a day or two days, right? What is the likelihood that you are going to continue to be able to replicate that over and over again so that you could have enough money to retire? Yeah. And then they just stare at me blankly. And I'm like, it, it, do you do you think that you can keep doing it? Like you're what you're doing is getting really, really lucky. And it's very hard to continue to repeat lucky scenarios over and over again, because then they wouldn't be luck. That's the opposite yeah. of luck. So when I get them to kind of think that way, that's when I think a little light bulb goes off in their head where they go, okay, I see what's going on. So, so most of my money should be in ETFs and, and funds and, and equity funds. And for those listening, equity is literally just another way to say stocks. So like stock funds, right? Yeah. With hundreds of hundreds of stocks so that you're not picking one or two and just, you know, hoping that those are the ones that do really well. Instead, you have a lot of different companies that represent most of the market, if not all of the market. And then, you know, that you just kind of ride the performance of the market, which over time, every single stock chart will show you that the market goes up over long periods of time. So you can kind of just have that peace of mind that we talked about a little yeah. bit earlier. So there's another statistic that the majority, I think it's 80% of passive mutual funds outperform actively managed funds. So right. even the smartest fund managers cannot outperform the market long term. So there you go. That's pretty good. That's right. Yep. Yeah. That's actually, a, I just saw that the other day. That's a report from Spiva. So if y'all are looking for a source on that, that's Spiva, S-P-I-V-A. They have all types of charts that will show you how the, the active funds, you pay more for them, but they don't end up doing more for you. So, right. you know, at the end and of the day, for in LA since I've been in the business, so it's, that's not new news. So people don't want to hear that though. They want to, they want to yeah. play with, they want to, they want to do the fun stuff with the money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. I almost don't want to wrap up because I just want to keep hearing all the wisdom you've got, but um, I do want to respect your time. And the one question I want to make sure I ask is there are a lot of young women in my audience, particularly age 20, 22, all the way up to age 40. Uh, and I just love making sure that they can, can walk away with knowing like what actionable things they can do. Because a lot of these women actually write to me, they comment on my posts and they say like, I don't really feel confident right now to, you know, just make a change in my financial life. Um, so what, what would you say, Carrie, should be like an early step, maybe like a first step for someone who is really feeling like they just don't have the confidence to take that step to change their, their financial life. And maybe they're feeling a bit of overwhelm right now with all of the stuff we've talked about, crypto and hot stocks and social media and headlines about yeah. the stock market and inflation's at the highest it's ever been. And it, it, there's so much noise, you know, um, what would you offer them to say, like, here's a simple thing that you can do to get started? Yeah, hopefully this sounds simple, but first of all, avoid the noise. Mm. avoid the noise and for those of you those of the young women hopefully they have access to a 401k uh, let me just tell you sort of three things that in terms of getting the foundation of your finances yep. first is if you have a 401k with a match a company match absolutely make sure you're saving if you're in your 20s 10 percent of your income toward your retirement uh, right. So, so 10%. And, and matter of fact, with my daughter, who's 25, she just got out of college, you know, a few years ago. And I did this with all my kids. We, we created a budget and we put 10% of their budget right away into their 401k. And when I say 401k, hopefully you have that with a match because that a lot of times it allows you to double what you're saving. And so if you don't do that, you're walking away from free money. And, and, and so not only save, but invest. And again, we talked about ETFs, like an S&P 500 that right. represents all industries in the United States, just something like that. That's for um, long-term. And, and so, so save and invest for your retirement. Again, 401k or your IRA. Two, make sure you pay off your credit card debt. Get it down because you're probably paying 15 to 17%, you can put that money in your savings. You know, why are you paying it to the credit cards? Put it toward yourself, pay yourself. And then also have an emergency fund of cash 
that can cover three to six months of ex essential expenditures, food, you know, utilities, home. So that, you know, it's retirement, credit cards, and an emergency fund. I think the emergency fund is key too, because what we saw during the pandemic was a lot of people didn't have it. Yes. And then they lost their jobs and it's like, okay, so now I don't have anything. Now I have no choice but to use my credit cards, which is only making my financial situation worse. So that emergency fund has such a core and key part, a role to play um, in your financial situation that even if you feel like it's just sitting there and you're not using it and you're tempted to use it for something, just keep in mind that when you most need it, it'll be there. Yeah, yeah, emergency fund. And, and, and just having that little bit of money gives you confidence to do oh, yeah. other things. And then I'm going to say, so if you've got those three things covered, you can invest outside of your retirement. And But don't invest for anything in which you'll need the money any earlier than, say, five or seven years. Right. Like if you're going to go on a vacation or you're going to buy a house in a couple of years, that should be in probably a money market fund or something like something like right. that. Or high yield savings, right? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yep. Savings, something like that, but not in the stock market. But for any longer term goals, again, five, seven years beyond, then you can invest. And, and the same principles apply that you and I talked about this whole core and explore, finding an all equity, um, you know, like an SP 500 or, or a Schwab 1000. These are all just. Uh, or, or there's even uh, robo advisors now that provide a, uh, a diversified portfolio of cash, right. stocks, and bonds based on your risk tolerance and your time frame of when you're going to need the money. And by the way, young people, uh, especially for retirement, should be more in equities and and less, probably not even any bonds. If you're in your 20s and you're not going to retire for another 40 years, you yeah. should be in equity funds. You know, and again, not just the U.S., but international and, and so forth, and small companies and large companies. Now I'm overdoing it. But a robo-advisor is also another, and, and most finance, big financial institutions offer those as well. It's basically a, a managed account. It manages it for you for a low cost. So, it, it, and, and, and like lastly, get help. There's so many companies that would love to help you and, and, and kind of shepherd you to get you on your feet you know, on, on this, it's just, um, there, there are people that want to help. Back to your analogy. I mean, I, you, when you walk into a gym, if you don't know how to use the equipment, you're just going to feel overwhelmed and you're just not going to really feel excited about working out. Right. But if yeah. you have a fitness coach mm -hmm. to explain yeah. to you what each station is and how to use it and which ones you should focus on to reach your, your goals and why, just, and why, and why, and why this is going to help. It just, it, it's, a, it's a breath of fresh air for you. If you felt confused and overwhelmed, that coach can really make a difference. Um, so I love that point about get help. If you are in your 20s, 30s, 40s, this is just a great time to find somebody to talk to about your goals for the next five, for the next year, for the next yeah. five years, for the next 10 years and beyond and have them help you put together a plan that can help you achieve those goals. Because yeah. um, it's hard. It's hard when you're all alone. And if you've never gotten class about money, the confidence, where's the confidence going to come from? You don't have the knowledge. Confident, confidence usually comes from knowledge. When I know something, I feel confident about my ability to execute on that knowledge. But yeah. if you're lacking the knowledge, you, you, you know, that's the first kind of step. So I really yeah. like that you added that in. Don't be afraid to get help. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, my last question, which I always wrap up the show with is um, a money motto or like a money mantra. Um, but before I ask you for your money mantra or money motto, I want just people to be able to go and follow you and keep hearing more of your wisdom. You have a syndicated column called Ask Carrie. You have a, about half a million followers on LinkedIn. Like you, you're, you know, you've a very uh, strong influence in the financial literacy space. So where can people come and follow you and find you and, and get more of, of your wisdom? So I would, so you can find my Ask Carrie column on schwabmoneywise.com or schwab.com, but it's definitely on Schwab Money Wise, which is a great, again, educational resource with no sales. And, um, or you can follow me on Twitter at, you know, at Carrie Schwab or Carrie Schwab Pomerantz on, on LinkedIn, uh, uh, which is, you know, another, another resource. And I talk about not just financial literacy and have the Ask Carrie column, but also talk about philanthropy and being involved and, and leadership and so forth. So a lot of different topics. And, and um, you know, I was going to tell you another book, but this is a little, it, the, the audience here may not want to, um, may feel like it's too old for them, but I wrote, actually wrote a couple of books, but, 
but the more recent one is the Chosh Fob Guide to Finance Finances After 50. And while that sounds really old, it all the first half of the book applies to everybody. And it's written in 50 questions. So you can just go plug and play depending on what your situation is. And I know a lot of people are thinking about their parents as well. So that could be helpful. Yeah. yeah. You know, I actually like that you said that I, I read a book, um, which was like how to like retiring a millionaire or something or like, re- or how to retire, like if you if you don't have, if you didn't prepare until like the last five years or something, I forget the, the title of it, it was probably a David Bach book, but I just remember like, feeling like I had hacked the system. Because even though I'm only in my 30s, I was reading about what I need to do in my 50s. Like I was re- I, I was kind of like, skipping ahead in life and getting so I know like you're right a lot of the listeners are probably going to be like oh a book about how to figure things out in your 50s like but if you can read it now think about how much ahead of the game you're going to be because you already know that so I actually do recommend reading books that are not necessarily targeted to your current age but maybe like near peer like slightly above your age because it's a it's a it's a little hack you know what I mean it's a bit of a hack in terms of like always thinking ahead like it's like a chess move you always want to be thinking about my next move and that's one one way to do it is just read books like yours which kind of give you a glimpse of of what's to come so you're you're not like caught off guard when you when you are in that phase and it's not overwhelming because you can just read a chapter here and a chapter there and you'll learn right well i'll link to all of that in the show notes and in the description box in the youtube video so people should be able to find it very easily um and and there we go. That's so that segues us to the last question, which is about a money mantra. And this is something that I always tell people that, you know, I just like to share this with people that are listening, because it's something that we can always just keep top of mind that can kind of inspire us to guide us to make smarter money decisions in life. So what would you say a, a helpful money mantra or money motto would be? Well, since most of your audience is 40 and under, I'm going to say it's not how much money you have. It's how much time you have to save and invest. And it's all because of compound growth and what young people have that older people don't have. And that is time, time for their money to grow. And, you know, there's so many examples about it's just the magic of compound growth that makes the big difference in our lives financially. And so a young person in their 20s, save 10% for the rest of your life. For your retirement and you should ha- have a relatively secure uh, life. However, if you wait till your 30s, you're going to need to save closer to 20% of your save or of your uh, income toward your retirement because you've lost some time there. And, and then if you're in your 40s, you have to save 30%. So you can see that it's again, it's it, it, and again, it's not about how much money you have, even if it's a hundred dollars a month. It's, it's how much time you have, not, not how much money you have. I was listening to a Peter Atia talk that he did. I don't, I think it was a Google talk or some, some talk on YouTube that I watched. Um, and Peter Atia is a doctor who talks about, um, uh, expanding your lifespan, longevity, right? Trying to live as long as possible and be healthy for as long as possible. So, but, but he introed his talk by saying, everybody wants to be Warren Buffett right? Everybody hears about Warren Buffett being the, you know, one of the richest people alive. And at that time, I think he was actually the richest person. And, you know, he said, but I, I can guarantee you if, he, if Warren Buffett could trade places with you, you're 21, 22, you're 25, you're 31, yeah. you want to be Warren Buffett? Guess what? Warren Buffett would give up all of his worth to be you again. Why? Because he's, you know, he's in his 80s. It, it, you would, time is what you would want more of in life, yeah. you know, not always money. And so it's so yeah. interesting that, that he said it that way. I thought, oh, wow. Yeah. Everybody wants to be Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett wants to be younger. It's like, yeah. so the person with the most money wishes they could get more time and young people have more time, but they, exactly. you know, if, they, if they're not, like you said, if you don't um, capitalize on that time and really maximize it by starting early and, and investing often, you know, if you get lucky enough to know about it, amazing. But if you're hearing this and you haven't taken action, let this be your sign. Like the time is now. Yeah, <laughs> you got to yeah, get started. Yeah, yeah I yeah. love that motto. Yeah. Well, thank you so you much, think. Carrie. This uh, has been really. so fun and you're so fabulous. I just love all the stories you shared and all of your wisdom. And it was just such an honor to have you. So thank you again uh, for being here. Thank you. I learned something from you too, right? We always learn from each other. Yeah, that's, that's right. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day, Carrie. You too. You take care.
If you like this video, which I'm sure you did because the video was the bomb, then you're going to want to watch all the other episodes of the Mind Your Money with Miss Be Helpful podcast. And they're all right here in this playlist. So click the playlist to watch those episodes. And if you haven't subscribed to this YouTube channel yet, I don't know what you're waiting for. Click the subscribe button right now so you can get videos every single week and to join Team Be Helpful right here. That's all I have for you guys. Till next time, peace.